Hey everybody, this is Ian O'Byrne. I just wanted to put together this uh, walk through this screencast of a lecture for week two. Uh, so once again, we're looking at theoretical perspectives and context of language development. Uh, it's a mouthful, but basically this is chapter two in our auto textbook. Um, some of this we already saw and we went through in class before. Uh, in this chapter, auto basically provides four different theoretical perspectives that are going to frame our look at language development. Um, this is nativist, uh, cognitive development, behaviorist, and interactionist. And once again, these are just theoretical perspectives. They're ways to think about language development. So basically, in a sense, what we're thinking of is, you know, we're, we're trying to make sense of the interactions that are happening inside of kids' heads as they're learning new languages. Um, we talked about in class the other day that these are things that we can't really see. Um, so theoreticians and teachers and educators are taking a look at what students do, looking at different students across time and trying to make sense of it. And then we test those uh, hypotheses and from those tests, uh, if we find ourselves to be proven correct, then we can make theory about what is happening. Um, so these are theories that we've developed over time. Uh, in class, we broke up into groups and we shared, uh, we did a little bit of research and we identified the common top talking points and then the theories um, and the theoreticians that wrote those theories and taught those to each other. We saw this guy talking about jigsaw strategies. Um, that was the main way that we brought this out in our classroom and we shared with one another. Um, and the key piece was what are, what's involved in the four different theories? Who are the theoreticians involved? And then most importantly, what are the talking points that we have for each one of those? Um, at a later date, we'll take a look at how those uh, intersect with one another. So the, the, the perspectives um, that we looked at, it's important to know how they are a little bit similar and how they're different. The nativist perspective, uh, Noam Chomsky did a lot of the initial work, but basically the thinking is that the, the child is inherently born with or has innate capability for language development. For the, so for the most part, you're born with the ability to pick up language, understand language, and use language. Um, you know, there is a universal grammar, there, there's rules or syntax for language, um, and then through the language acquisition device, through the LAD, that's a process by which you can understand it. But for the most part, you're born with it. You come into the world, you're ready to go. The challenge is, and usually the, the, the question that people have with the nativist perspective is, well, there's thousands of languages and dialects, and how do we know that if you're born in a certain area, you might have um, your language acquisition devices set for uh, that particular area? So that's one of the challenges. So the, the LAD was considered and, and promoted as a possible way to help students acquire language in a specific area or syntax given their parents and their upbringing. Um, but basically, uh, ways that we can activate this or what this means for the classroom is, you know, you have book sharing and you read aloud to students, you provide students with multiple opportunities to read and write and draw uh, what they see from those. And the main thing that we're thinking about is, you know, showing students what it means, uh, what are those syntax and what are those rules and what's that grammar for our language. So in an English speaking culture um, and for English language learners, we're trying to provide opportunities for students to see what are the rules, what are the, the sort of non-negotiables, um, even though there's always exceptions to the rule, but what are the non-negotiables in the English language? Um, what are the rules for our language? The cognitive developmental perspective um, views language and literacy development much in the same way that we view other forms of learning and cognitive development. And basically that's as you mature, as you grow a little bit, language and your ability to acquire language also grows. Uh, Jean Piaget uh, basically framed a lot of this initial thinking and it says that there's no real, you know, unique learning mechanism that you have. You just learn just the same way that you learn over time in other areas, just as the same way that cognitively we develop. We also develop in, in our use of language and literacy. Um, and so 
part of the challenge here is that the, you know if, if you're going to talk about cognitive development you're also going to look at a, a development or a progression as students learn to acquire language uh, so this perspective holds that there's an initial sensory motor stage that's that first stage of cognitive development that's children that are sitting there and they're playing and they're ooing and they're eyeing and they're cooing and they're sort of checking out what's happening in the world but they don't really get anything um, and then we looked at the we look at the object permanence stage and there's a, a good video in here to check out but that's basically the thinking behind when a baby plays peekaboo that's you know, if, if you're sort of out of sight, the child doesn't know that you are there or not there. And when you suddenly reappear, they think you just um, popped up out of thin air. Um, so if you cover up a toy with a blanket, uh, for, for all intents and purposes, the child thinks that the toy is gone. Um, then we move into a symbolic representation stage where individuals, children can start to understand language and also use of symbols. They start to understand that you know, now that they understand object permanence, that things that are covered up or not initially seen don't just disappear from our worldview, um, then we start to attach symbols. So we understand what different symbols mean and what language means, and that there is an opportunity to share language and information within uh, the symbols that we use in the alphabet. Um, then we start to use schema to understand what's happening cognitively. So a schema is basically a, a, a net in our cognitive space. It's a way that we make sense of the world. So a schema in many situations is just a, uh, you know, a story that we tell ourselves cognitively to make sense of the world and try and make sense of our experiences. So you have different schema for uh, when you go play with you know, friends, when you go to a class, when you go play video games, you have a schema that you attend to. If you go to a school dance, there is a different schema. Um, if you go to church, there is a much different schema than you would have if you go to a video game or a dance or to play video games or any one of those things. So we have different, you know, quote unquote, like stories that we tell ourselves to make sense of the world. Um, then cognitive development goes into the pre-operational stage, that's that second stage of development. That's where we really, or the child really starts to make sense of the world and their perceptions and they use symbols and pictures to make sense of all these different pieces. Um, so once again, cognitive development is looking at how do we uh, develop over time, that language develops over time, just the same way that thought and other cognitive uh, capabilities develop over time. Uh, we're looking at that sensory motor stage moving into the pre-operational, um, and it's the job of the educator to match learning activities with the believed state of the child's cognitive uh, ability in terms of language. Behaviorist perspective uh, draws a lot on behaviorism and the work of B.F. Skinner. Um, we believe that, or behaviorists believe in terms of language development and language acquisition, that for the most part the child acquires language through nurturing. Um, so they're not really, as we've seen before, they're not born with some inherent ability to acquire language and use language or understand syntax. They, they build it up over time. They acquire stimuli they watch what's happening in their home or school or community. They're looking at stimuli and responses and events, and then they will act, and then they will see the response to that action, or they will see other students act, and they will respond to the, they will uh, pay attention to the actions or the responses to those actions. Um, but basically, there's a lot of, of action, reaction, imitation, reinforcement. Um, so it's a lot of, of nurturing. It's students paying attention to what people do with language and then slowly understanding how to make sense of the world that way. Um, as a corollary to this, uh, we see this work in uh, acquisition of web literacies. So most of us, we learned how to be web literate uh, online, how to be a better searcher for information or how to use Google by trial and error, by testing out different things. Most of us weren't really taught how to, to search online effectively. We sort of muddle our way around and then we, we see other people try to do things and, and fail or succeed. 
Um, so we sort of, you know, it's, it's a, a growth process over time and we're trying to figure out what other people do. In terms of what this means for, for our classroom, uh, possibilities for a behaviors perspective include uh, an understanding by the educator on the stimuli and the reinforcements that you use in your classroom uh, because we, have, we need to understand that our students are paying attention to that. Um, so for an example, if a student's trying to read and having difficulty and other, other kids laugh or make fun of that student, what sort of positive or neg negative reinforcement does that share with other students in the class? Um, another thing to consider as an educator is the, the power of repetition in reading strategies and writing strategies. Um, you know, having a, a word list that we continuously read and reread or also imitation. You know, as we see students write, we, we have them, uh, you know, try out and repeat letters and we have them draw over or trace over letters um, trying to figure out exactly how to write and how to make sense as, as we try to write and share with others. The interactionist perspective, uh, sometimes was a, uh, for some of the groups they indicated it was a little challenging. The interactionist basically builds off of, of the, the last two that we had and it basically says that you know children acquire language and they understand language and literacy through attempts to communicate and interact with others around them. Um, so that's either the instructors or parents or teachers or classmates, but as they play with language and try to use language and how they try to read and write, um, what sort of reaction do they have? Uh, the, the nice thing about this perspective, in my humble opinion, is that it brings in a lot of the social, social cultural elements. So Lev Vygotsky and, and Bruner basically talk about well, the Vygotsky was all about social, uh, cultural or social constructivism and zone of proximal development. It's, um, you know, what can, a, what can a child do with uh, a little bit of help from another? Um, so it's basically how do students acquire language and use language through the support and assistance of others? How do they uh, support one another? How do, they, uh, how do teachers support one another? So there really are these little interactions uh, with, with colleagues, with peers, with friends, with family, with teachers that help students use and, and acquire language. Um, and it's really hammered home in uh, Camborne's conditions. So basically Camborn put together a series of conditions that uh, usually are, need to be in place to make it optimum for children to acquire written or oral languages. Um, these should be at home, school, sometimes in the community. Um, one thing that we need to know about these conditions is that they um, are interwoven, they interact dynamically, they are iter iterative. Um, and what I mean by that is that they don't, you don't move from condition one down to two, down to three. These aren't a step or a stage or a process these are different conditions that should interact and, you know, easily, we'll use that word, uh, move from one to the other. So immersion is basically looking at the child and the language that is used around the child. So that's one thing is use of language in and around the, the child. Uh, demonstration is the child witnessing the use of language for different purposes. So, you know, you should have teacher modeling or the parents using language or talking about language or reading in the home uh, engagement, the child is encouraged to participate in language interactions. So at home or school is the parent or the teacher encouraging the child to uh, speak and answer questions and get involved. Um, expectations, there should be times that the, the child is expected to respond to an adult or a teacher or a friend, um, there should be the expectation that, you know, if I address you, you should respond. Um, that's what communication is all about. That's what language and, and literacy are, are being used for. Um, approximations basically talks about uh, real communications. Um, so as a child is learning at the beginning and then as they're trying to acquire language, they're going to mess up. But they are close enough. So there's an approximation made by the adult 
that um, this is real communication. You know that that you are trying. You're trying to understand. You're going to mess up some verb tenses. You're going to mess up with the word. I mean, even as adults, we mess up with words. I messed up 35, 45 seconds ago. Um, but for the most part, you're trying, and that's you know real communication. That's real language use. Um, it needs to be better, but it's real usage. Employment. Um, the, the child is given opportunities to test out or try out developing competencies. So, you know, now that you are getting better at reading and writing, let's figure out different ways to use those strategies, use your new language skills out in the real world. Um, so it's test driving or testing out uh, your new skill or competence in competencies in language and literacy. And last but not least, response. It's the assessment or the analysis part. It's giving feedback. Um, it's, the, it's the teacher or the, the parent at home or a friend or family member giving feedback, hopefully positive feedback, but feedback nonetheless on the use of language and the ability to communicate. And that's why in our classrooms, especially, uh, and actually in all grade levels in our classrooms, it's important for clear, concise feedback so that the, the child can listen and learn and try and improve upon uh, the use of language in these areas. Uh, what does this mean for the classroom? Obviously, with the interactionist perspective, there's a lot of social interaction embedded in uh, this perspective. So, I mean, just as I was talking about, you know, feedback means, you know, hopefully positive. There's times that we do get negative feedback or critical feedback, but it's feedback nonetheless. So we need to understand the emotional, the social emotional context of what's happening as students learn. And that sometimes can provide a challenge. I mean, sometimes educators, sometimes parents, family, friends don't want to admit the social context or the emotional context of learning. They just want to share or provide feedback or nudge their child or a student and expect that the child or student understands. Uh, but we have to understand the, the social emotional context, uh, the engagement and the motivation that, that might take a hit if we don't exactly interact the way that they want to be interacted with. We take a little bit of a pivot here in chapter two and we talk about the brain in, in the development process. Um, once again, it's terribly important. It's, it's, it's important to remember that, you know, as I said at the beginning of this set of slides, you know, we are viewing these interactions from the outside. For the most part, you know, we cannot give a student a, a CT scan or a CAT scan as they're reading and writing or learning to read and write. We can't put a PET cap on a student. So we don't really know what's happening to the individual synapses in their head. We're looking from the outside. We are making hypotheses. We're making our best guess, uh, best guess uh, effort. And then we're trying to make theories and test those theories. Then we're trying to make hypotheses and test those theories. Um, so it's important to understand what the brain and the role of the brain is in these activities. Um, for one, we, we know through a lot of our work and through a lot of our research that the brain appears to be hardwired or pre-wired for language. Um, the brain is fantastically adept at picking up new languages, especially early on. Um, through the PET scans and through different, um, you know, brain imaging processes, we can see that language development lights up different parts of the brain. And as the brain matures, there is more language development that can occur. And the nice thing for uh, those of us that are a little bit older is that the brain, at least current brain research, says that the brain is terribly plastic, which means that it is possible for, you know, old dogs to learn new tricks. We also know that, and, and I believe this is terribly true as a social constructivist, that social interaction is critical for development. I think we need, you know, as we learn, we want to learn with others. We want to play with others. We want to know that what we're learning is important and vital. We want others to learn with us. Um, we want to interact with others. So in the learning process, especially with language and literacy, it's terribly important uh, and critical for development as we bring these uh, elements in. A lot of the key concepts as we look at brain and language development, um, and a lot of this just comes out of straight the, the hierarchy of the brain, 
Um, these are pieces that are in the chapter that we definitely need to, to define and understand and know what these terms mean. Um, you know, what happens as synapses fire and, and how does that interact within the different parts of the brain and make uh, cognition happen and especially language and literacy for this class. So these are things that we should be pretty adept at uh, understanding what the parts are, what the different elements are and how they interact. In terms of the different contexts, uh, this is pretty simple. I mean, this is stuff that we should know already, but it bears being repeated. There are multiple languages that, there are multiple contexts that affect language development. Um, we know that students should be improving and working on language and literacy development at home. We don't know in many cases what's happening. Um, so are we reading at home? Are we interacting? We also know that uh, we should be improving or working on language and literacy development across content areas, across grade levels at school. Um, and then the, the other important link is what's happening in the community. So, you know, we should know what's happening in our classrooms and our school. That's why we have curriculum. That's why we have scope and sequence and frameworks. Um, sometimes it's a challenge to understand what's happening at home and then what's happening from a language and literacy perspective across these areas. Um, sometimes the challenge is that there is an incongruence in what literacies are important across these areas. So the same literacies that our students use at home, are they the ones, the, the literacies and the language that we value at school, um, the language and literacies that we use out in the community or on the streets or in the playground uh, or in church, are those the same language and literacies that we value at school? Um, so these are some of the, the questions and some of the challenges that we have as we work in our classroom. In terms of how we interact in those con uh, contexts, um, the book details a couple different ways. Uh, one is through eye contact and shared reference. So, you know, if you are looking at a child and you have eye contact, you are using your eye contact and you are using your gestures and your, um, you know, movements to focus the child on exactly what you're trying to discuss. So it's a way to interact to make sure that the student is focused and that the student understands that you are communicating and interacting with them. Uh, another key piece is a communication loop, which is basically speaking, listening, talking, sharing back and forth in a circular pattern, uh, child-directed speech. Um, Otto does a great job of detailing this. It's basically, uh, they define it as utterances, so it's scaling back. We'll look at some of this in a video next week. It's scaling back of the languages that you use and the words you use, um, simplifying and changing the tone of what your your of your dialogue with students to make sure that they can definitely understand what you're talking about. Verbal mapping is an important strategy I try to use in my classes, um, which is basically descriptions, visual representations, um, images to try and help students understand what you're discussing and what this interaction is all about. A questioning interaction strategy, uh, very important. It's basically it's its tone and its its questions and its interactions, um, and it's um, not really grilling the student, but it's questioning back and forth in a in a questioning tone. So when you ask, when you raise your voice at the end of the question and say, you know which one of these is the correct answer, um, then the student knows through your tone and your interactions with them exactly what your point is. Uh, linguistic scaffolding is basically supportive dialogue. It's trying to get students to understand your perspective and, and you know being positive in the way you interact with them. And last but not least, mediation is uh, simplifying and, and whittling down the focus of your of your communication and interaction to make sure that students understand. Um, the last piece that we'll cover here is is there's different uh, the, the different contexts, home, school, and community. They, they have different uh, elements that make them p peculiar or special. Uh, there's different elements of cultural diversity that are changing uh, what happens in these different areas. So two slides ago when I was talking about language and literacy. Uh, how much does cultural diversity impact what's happening at home or school or within the community? Uh, social routines. So 
what is happening either in school or at home that is impacting everyday interactions, the way that students interact with one another, the way that uh, learners interact with teachers or parents, socioeconomic status. So how is that affecting, how is SES affecting uh, our students and, and the way they, they value things uh, in the classroom or home or out in the community? Uh, what impact is does the learning environment and the curriculum on the school have on the learning uh, on the language and literacy learning. So if the school is well kept, what does that mean? If the school is uh, beat down, if the school has, you know, armored doors, if it has, you know, uh, uh, alarms going off all the time, what are these, what does the environment, what impact does the environment have on learning in the school? And then of course, which sometimes we, we want to second guess, but the critical role of the classroom teacher you know, the, the job that all of you signed up for is terribly important as students try to make sense of learning and, and building in these skills. So once again, we're taking a look at chapter two of the text. We're looking at theoretical perspectives as we frame language learning and language development. It's important to remember um, that once again, we're talking about a, a period of time. We're talking about language development, literacy learning, talking about things that are happening cognitively. They're happening inside of our children's heads. Um, at this point, we do not have the ability in the normal classroom to step inside a child's head and examine exact what's happening. Um, so what we have to do is look at outside behaviors, look at assessments, and try and make our best guess or a hypothesis as to what's happening inside the child's head. Um, and then through decades of testing and writing and we, we ultimately develop theories to try and make sense of what's happening. So it's a subtle mix of theory and the brain and natural chemistry. So we're, we're looking at elements all the way down to the individual synapses firing and scaling way up to social interactions and nature versus nurture. So a lot of terribly fascinating things and that's chapter two.